This is Regain Wellness Podcast with Jamie Logie, episode 152, The Ketogenic Diet. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome to the Regain Wellness Podcast brought to you by Regain Wellness. Dot com. I'm Jamie Logie. I'll be your host today. And I wanted to do this episode on what's probably the biggest, to me at the moment, um, kind of nutrition, I don't know, you don't want to call it a movement per se, but lifestyle approach that a lot of people are doing from high level athletes to fitness competitors to bodybuilders to average, you know, weekend warriors and it's the ketogenic diet and there's a lot of information to share so I'm going to try and cover it as best as I can so I'll be talking about what it is how it works the possible you know benefits it has in your body issues that come with it uh, foods to include pretty much everything so it's going to cover a lot of stuff but like I said it's you know with the last few years these healthy eating kind of movements come and go where, you know, say like paleo. I mean, we go back. I mean, there's always different fad diets. I, a lot of these things I don't want to necessarily call diets because I think that's the wrong approach. It's more of a healthy um, eating lifestyle, like, you know, starting with paleo being one of the biggest things for a while where you see it everywhere. And that's kind of tapered away now. Just, you know, people by no fault of their own are always looking for whatever the next big thing is or the Mediterranean diet. And these things are all still beneficial and relevant, but the ketogenic diet or keto, I find it a little more prominent at the moment. So probably best to devote a whole episode to it. And that's what we're going to do. But before we do that, make here's the uh, generic shout out to make sure to subscribe to the podcast, wherever you find your podcast under rocks, under the, the sofa cushion, Apple podcasts, Stitcher radio, wherever you find a podcast, I should be there. Make sure you subscribe. That way you get the shows automatically sent to you. It saves me money on mail. I don't have to hand deliver them. Everybody's happy. Okay, let's get right into this. So what keto or ketogenic diet is, is essentially being, it's known as being a low fat, or sorry, a low carb diet where the body's producing what they call ketones in the liver. And these ketones will be used as energy as opposed to depending primarily on glucose, which you get from more of a higher carbohydrate based diet. And it's not to be confused. Like it goes by a few different names, you know, keto, ketogenic, low carb diet, low carb, high fat, LCHF. It's been a lot of people confuse eating a high protein diet with being in ketosis or being, or following a ketogenic diet. They're thinking they're eating a lot of protein and they're, you know, really limiting their carbs, but it is primarily a fat-based diet. So the people who are on this high-protein, low-carb diet aren't really following a ketogenic diet at all. So what it looks like here is when you're eating, you know, like the majority of people, if your diet's based in carbohydrates, which probably the average person is eating way too many of, we just have, um, you know, too much availability of these super high-energy forms of carbohydrate, whether it's in breads or pastas or rice or, uh, you know, like quinoas or things that are all amazing, but, or, or granola, even healthy granola. These things are all amazing, but when they're so carbohydrate dense, when you'd normally, like, think if you lived in a natural environment, you wouldn't have access to bread or pasta. I mean, you'd have to take a long time to procure it from growing your own wheat and harvesting it and grinding it down. And you'd only have small sizes, whereas you can eat a loaf of bread in one day, no problem, go get another one immediately. So our availability of carbohydrates is probably a little too high for the average person and especially uh, starchy, like refined carbohydrates and obviously refined sugars. And they do go hand in hand. Essentially, if you're eating anything white, probably the best thing to avoid white bread, white pasta, white rice, white sugars, all that sort of thing. So when you're eating something high in carbs, your body's going to produce glucose and insulin. And glucose is, you know, one of the easiest molecules for your body to convert and use as energy. So, you know, it's going to be chosen over any other energy source. I like to call 
carb things like, you know, whether it's granola or bread or whatever, they're like fast acting carbs. And then from that, you get insulin from the pancreas. It's produced to process the glucose in your bloodstream. It takes it around the body. It's like a shuttle service. It's like Uber for your body. It's kind of how insulin works. So the idea with all this, since the glucose is being used as your main energy, your fat is really not as needed and it's, you know, more likely to be stored. So typically on like a normal high carbohydrate diet, you're using glucose constantly because it's constantly available. And if it's not always used, there's a good chance it could be stored as body fat and it's got that, you know, insulin raising effect. And insulin can also be known as, you know, a fat producing and storing hormone. It's kind of a backup energy source. So when you lower your carbs, the body goes into what is known as ketosis. And this is a natural process the body initiates to help us survive when food intake is low. Our, our modern society is just so out of whack with what our bodies kind of developed and evolved from, where we have obviously constant access to food, constant access to high energy food, and we don't go. I did a whole episode on intermittent fasting just talking about that issue of, you know, people not having to go more than two hours of eating and the, the concept of panicking if they're not going to eat every three to four hours and how that's maybe a little out of tune with what your body's uh, better able to handle. And a lot of our hunger is psychological compared to actual physical hunger. We don't need to eat every two to three hours at all. And especially with the wrong things. If you're making some cleaner food choices, it might not be too bad. Or if you have more athletic pursuits or physique pursuits or whatever, it, you know, it, it's got its its place there. But, you know, in, in our natural state where we would have um, evolved and lived, you know, there's days you would go without eating. And our bodies seem to be built to handle that situation. And when we're in the state where food intake is low, your body produces ketones, which are produced from the breakdown of fats in the liver. And the end goal of you know, a properly maintained keto diet is to force your body into this metabolic state. This is the whole idea behind the ketogenic diet. We don't through this, we, like you're not starving yourself, but you're essentially starving yourself of carbohydrates. And I'll talk about in a bit what that does and, you know, what seem to be some interesting benefits. So it comes down to the fact how amazingly adaptive your body becomes to what you put in it, whether you overload it with fats, take away carbohydrates. Um, just in that situation, it's going to, you know, if you've always been eating carbohydrates, your body's so used to it, you become a sugar burner and it sort of sets in. And then there is the chance, you know, in under those conditions, those constant conditions, you maybe have some more body fat. You maybe have some blood sugar issues. You maybe get more of the chance for type 2 diabetes and more obesity and potential heart disease when you're, especially if it's a constant exposure to these inferior fast acting carbs is telling you about. But, you know, when you, with the idea with, I'll just stay straight up. This is all information purposes as well. And I'm not advocating one diet over another and obviously something to, double check with your doctor. I've, if, even if that goes without saying, I'm going to say it anyway. This is just more to present what the ketogenic diet is about. So, you know, when you start to uh, switch and overload your body with fats, healthy fats, and take away carbohydrates, you will begin to burn ketones as a primary primary energy source. So, and if you have these optimal ketone levels, it can offer, you know, health benefits, weight loss benefits, physical benefits, um, I'll, I'll get into some more stuff. But I mean, some super high end athletes have done this diet. Like LeBron James was doing this for a while. And there's some NHL hockey players, which is the ultimate in high intensity uh, exercise and training that is, have been doing this form of diet. I mean, people have adopted this thing and it's provided. I mean, when you're an athlete where your career and everything depends on your body's performance, you're not going to put anything to chance. And especially of a performance-based physical nature. So the fact that some people have adopted this shows, you know, it does have some, you know, seemingly interesting physical benefits. And then there's the mental performance benefits. And that's one of the biggest things that people have gotten out of ketogenic diets and, keto and ketosis. I'll say right now before getting into 
um, just more details. What it looks like an average ketogenic diet is going to be a breakdown that 70% of your calories are going to come from fat. 5% or sorry. Okay. 25% are going to come from protein and only 5% are from carbohydrates. And that's on the low end. It can go even higher as far as the ratio of fat. And it's got its roots in um, being a therapeutic diet for pediatric epilepsy. And its goal was to, this goes back to the 20s, and it provide, the goal of it was to provide just enough protein for body growth and repair and some sufficient calories to, you know, that are, were important to maintain the correct weight for age and height and stuff like that. And then how it became like the classical therapeutic version of it was, you know, to help with that, you know, the cognitive function, the issues with that, with the higher um, fat intake to, you know, for, for brain health and, and, and getting in things like medium chain triglycerides and things that are, you know, from shorter carbon chains and stuff like that, that would be more beneficial to um, treating things like epilepsy and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's what it has its roots in. And then people were found to have a reduction in the amount of, or the frequency of the seizures they would have. And, you know, from way back with the info on this, almost half of children and young people with epilepsy who have tried some form of this diet, saw the number of seizures drop by at least half. And the, and the effects would continue even after they discontinued the diet. So it was interesting. It was primarily for children and, and young people. And then, you know, with adults, they would get into it not finding as good a result. So what happens is how this kind of gets into the mainstream. Of, but it goes back to the 90s, kind of mid-90s. And there's a Hollywood producer named Jim Abrahams. And he had a son who had severe ep- epilepsy. And it was effectively controlled by doing the diet. So he created what's called the Charlie Foundation to promote it. Um, You know, the publicity, he was on NBC Dateline and there was a a television movie, I think it's called First Do No Harm with Meryl Streep. And just to kind of spread this more and the foundation sponsored lots of research studies and, you know, in in this is 1996 and then that sort of like sparked more of a renewed interest in like okay w- what's maybe more behind this diet and then as they get into more clinical trials and stuff like that um y- using animal models mind you which is generally the standard for any sort of clinical trials so take that for what it's worth but it's you know these trials are suggesting that the ketogenic diets provide a real like an, what they call neuroprotective um, effect and disease modifying benefits for people with neurodegenerative disorders and, and cognitive issues and stuff like that. So as of 2012, there, you know, there's limited clinical trial data in these areas and outside of pediatric, uh, pediatric epilepsy, the, you know, the, the research is, is still in the research stage. You know what I mean? This isn't, gospel truth. But what I'm sharing here today is how people were finding these other benefits that are are almost, if you want to call like side effects, but positive things as far as the weight loss and whatever. So as people were doing these for these, you know, neurodegenerative disorders, they were finding these other, I guess, you know, symptoms is almost the word to say. And then, you know, as this spreads and people report on it, it gets picked up and that, you know, and who knows how these things really start to spread, but it's got to the point now where it's somehow become a mainstream thing. So here's what benefits have been seen. And again, I'm not saying this is gospel truth. This is just from what's been observed. Doesn't mean it's a direct cause, but you know, there seems to be some promise or there might be other factors at work. But what we're looking at as far as benefits from doing the ketogenic diet is the first probably primary one for the average person is weight loss. So the idea is that your body, you're using your body fat as an energy source. It's fat is extremely dense at any given time, say with carbohydrate storage, like your body will store 
carbohydrates in the form of um, glycogen, and that's like your muscle energy. But it, it'll, you know, within it'll store it in the liver, or the muscles, or whatever. So at any time you've got, I don't know, four hundred to five hundred grams, give or take a bit, and you know that's going to provide you maybe, I don't know, two thousand calories worth of energy, which you know is effective and it can be used quick. But as far as what you've got in your body fat as a reserve fuel tank. Even the leanest person, even a competitive bodybuilder with like under five per eat like three percent body fat, like three to five percent body fat, has at least thirty thousand calories still available in in various body fat storage. And obviously, for the average person, that goes through the roof. So you've just got this almost endless supply of backup energy. And on keto, your your insulin, like he's talking about that fat storing hormone, the levels drop really low and it turns your body more in the the perspective of this that more into a fat burning machine and the ketogenic diet has shown better results compared to low fat and high carb diets and and things like that even in the long run um, then you've got the with the insulin that control the blood sugar and a lot of diabetics will follow this diet, they'll do, you know, keto will naturally lower your blood sugar levels due to the types of food you're eating. You're not eating these fast acting carbs. And there's studies have shown that the ketogenic diet is a more effective way to manage and prevent diabetes compared to a low calorie diet. So you still need that nutrition intake. But a lot of people I know have done well on reduced calorie diets as far as reversing type two diabetes. So, you know, again, I'll, have to, I'll probably say it a million times, but this is not, you know, written in stone. There, there's, everyone's got different variables that can affect outcomes depending on whatever their nutrition approaches are. But people who are on, or sorry, who are pre-diabetic or have type 2 diabetes um, do pretty well on this sort of thing. So um, the next benefit is that mental focus I talked about before. And some people use it you know, regardless of the, the epilepsy thing or whatever, some people are using it specifically for the increased mental performance and ketones are used by your brain and they're a pretty good fuel source for your brain. So when you lower your carb intake, you avoid those big spikes in blood sugar. And this can be seen to help improve focus, concentration, memory, just all those different things associated with cognitive function. And there's other studies too that show that in increase Intake of fatty acids can have impacting benefits on our brain's function. Your brain needs fats. Like you're a fat head. We're all fat heads. Our brains are physically made up of different omega-3 based fats and DHA and stuff. And the problem is when you don't get healthy fats in your diet or you have too much in the form of starchy carbohydrates and sugars, your brain can suffer from that. And and in a lot of cases with people with you know depression or any any cognitive issues there are indicators that they're low in omega threes and lower overall fat, which, you know, is the structure, the physical structure of your brain. So that's a big reason why people do it. There's the, I, the benefit of increased energy and a balancing of your hunger and, you know, with fat, with healthy fats too. I mean, we're talking about the good, clean, healthy fats, whether they're medium chain tri triglycerides from coconut oil, olive oil, avocado, um, nuts and seeds, grass-fed beef, like true grass-fed stuff like that, salmon. The, this kind of fat is like a slow-burning log that if you're – think of your body's like metabolism as a fire. It's like putting a big log on it that's just going to steadily burn compared to if you put, I don't know, things like bread and pasta. It's like throwing – kindling on a fire like it's gonna burn it's not gonna be a you know a quick fast burst like say in the case of like candy or sugar or whatever that's like throwing paper on the fire or, or, or tissue paper it just immediately burns up it's gone in a second that's how fast it acts and that's not ideal for your body um, hormonally metabolically the whole deal with um, say something like the pastas and the rice it's think of it more like the kindling it's not gonna instantly burn up it's going to burn for a little bit, but not steadily. You're going to be hungry again afterward. The idea with the fat and, and some protein 
it's like that big log on the fire that's just going to consistently burn for hours and hours. So you get better and more reliable energy. You feel more energized during the day. Um, the, you know, fats are still a good molecule to burn as fuel and you're more satisfied. You're more satiated because of the fat intake and the protein and whatever. So, and then, um, interestingly, there's seen a potential benefits of cholesterol and blood pressure improvements. And it seems weird, you know, with the idea with having a higher fat intake to improve triglyceride levels and cl- cholesterol levels that are associated with, you know, that plaque buildup and, you know, more specifically, low carb, high fat diets show um, a dramatic not just the decrease in that your bad cholesterol LDL, which aren't actually cholesterol, they're carrier proteins, low density lipoproteins, but they're associated and they decrease the bad ones, but also raise your your good HDL compared uh, the concentration compared to like low fat diets. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes deep in this, and there's different studies on low carb diets um, also show better improvement in blood pressure over other diets. Um, you know, some blood pressure issues are associated with excess weight, uh, which, you know, is a bonus because people on the keto diet tend to lose weight. Uh, then you've got the benefit of the insulin resistance. Like I said before, your your body, you know, when your body is constantly having to secrete insulin, when you're eating so many carbohydrates and sugars and starches that just have this insulin release, after a while, your, your body has to your pancreas has to secrete more and more and that can lead to burnout. And then that's when you're looking at things like type two diabetes, if it's left unmanaged. So there's a lot of research again, showing that a low carb based ketogenic diet can help people lower their insulin levels to healthier ranges. So, um, and, and like I said before, even if you're athletic and I talk about some pro athletes have done this, you, you can benefit from that, insulin like optimization on a ketogenic diet through eating those high fat foods your body can stay a little more consistent and perform the, i can't remember the guy's name but he won the it's not the it's the big iron man where it's like the extended version of it that i think they do in hawaii where it's it's like triple the amount you'd normally do of the distance of the biking this what i can't even remember what it is but that guy was on a ketogenic diet. I mentioned like LeBron James trained that way for for quite a bit. People don't necessarily always stay with this, and they, you know, it's sometimes seen as maybe a shorter term benefit, um, kind of like a reset for your body. And some people stick with it, so it, it depends on the person. It's just interesting that extreme endurance athletes have have done this sort of thing before, which which blew my mind. I, I was amazed personally seeing some hockey players do this because I personally, I couldn't imagine not having a carbohydrate based fuel for, you know, the average hockey game, you know, an hour long, you got three 20 minute periods. Each shift is around 45 seconds to a minute and it's a full out sprint. If you skated before or if you've seen hockey, you know how intense it is. So not only are you going faster than an Olympic sprinter, you're doing it while balancing on this like eight millimeter little blade in the ice and having to make quick changes. And it's the ultimate in like high intensity interval type training where it's a sudden burst with followed by a rest period, you know, where you've got a 45 to second to a minute shift. And then you're sitting on the bench for say 90 seconds to two minutes and then back at it again. And you're carrying us over the whole course. So it's just, it, it's not only are these quick bursts and sudden changes and explosive movements and shots, you're also trying not to get absolutely rocked to hell by guys flying around at the same speed. And you're battling for pucks in the corner or in front of the net. And it, it's like, I don't know if you, if you haven't played it, the only, like I've played hockey my whole life. I, I play two to three times a week. It's still my main form of like cardio um, and high intensity training. And if you can, I don't know, it's like picture running as fast as you ever run, but doing that for almost a minute at the same time, depending on where the, the point of the game is you're at, like wrestling someone like think how exhausting it is to like wrestle. And that's what happens if you're battling for pucks. It's a full body exertion 
while you're skating. It's just, it's an insane amount of um, energy burning or whatever. So the fact that, I guess this is more my interest now I'm talking now, like the fact that there's high, the highest level hockey players in the world that have done this diet, it, it baffles me. Um, but, you know, maybe there's something to it. So uh, one more benefit I'll just look at here, and that's to do with acne, which I didn't even know this was one of the, the benefits as I've been researching more. One of the common, you know, ex uh, benefits is people get improvements in their skin when they switch the ketogenic diet. And they there's studies that show drops in lesions and skin inflammation because I, I think it must be because they don't have that high insulin surge and that high starch intake and sugar and, you know, the, the starchy carbs that turn into sugar in the body and that can lead to inflammation and that can lead to skin problems. And there's another study that shows a probable connection between high carb eating and increased acne and not just the bad skin, but specifically acne. And one of the biggest things that people can do to prevent acne is to reduce dairy intake just because it is very inflammatory in people like lactose intolerance is the world's most common food allergy. And, and apparently like 80% of the world actually has a um, resistance to dairy just, just because it's not the, the milk and the, the stuff we have access to is, is not real dairy. It's been so it's a, corrupted from the amount of hormones and stuff that these cows can be pumped full of. And these are what are causing a lot of the reactions in people's body. But not just that, like the, the milk, like 1% milk, 2% milk, skim milk, the, 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 that's not real. That's something created, whether it's hydro infused or different kind of uh, mechanical processes that go through. So, I mean, you're not consuming something natural and you're consuming it from an entirely different species, you know, this is a whole side rant. Um, as much I do for vegan and vegetarian listeners, I primarily believe in plant-based diet and I do believe there are room for some animal proteins, but specific ones from the cleanest, most pastured grass fed natural sources. And even from that, I really am not a big fan of dairy overall. I just, I, I don't know. There's no, mammal that consumes dairy past around the two year age point, let alone from a whole other species. And it's interesting if you took like a skim milk to a, a baby calf, they won't even touch it because it's not real. You know, it's only in the whole milk form that they get it or the, the, the first feedings they get and colostrum and different natural things. So it, it's, I just, I don't know if we're <laughs> meant to eat dairy at all, specifically milk. And for people with bad skin, when they reduce or eliminate dairy, it's one of the biggest things people report as far as improved skin and acne and stuff like that. So, you know, from the specific lactose, but God knows what hormones and crap that are pumped into these animals. So, okay, so that's what's perceived as different benefits um, from it. So what does it look like? Like, what do you actually eat on this thing? So this is where it's tough. Because it is a lot of planning. It's a lot of calculating. you got to be very aware of things to keep things in the right ratios. You know, I mentioned about that, like 70% calories from fat, 25% from protein, 5% from carbs. And that's very tough to, to stay in balance with. So, um, I, you know, with carbs, I mean, depending on the person and your size and your age and whatever, I mean, for some people, it's only like 15 grams of carbs per day. I mean, that's like two mini eggs. I mean, it's so easy to um, not do it correctly. And your the carbide, carbohydrates you are having are going to come obviously mostly from vegetables and stuff like that. You're not eating any refined carbohydrates, no wheat, you know, bread, pasta, cereals, no potatoes, beans, legumes, even like fruit because it's high in it. So this is what turns off a lot of people from a ketogenic diet. And I, I agree, I'm trying to show the whole sides here. You know, you're starting now to limit um, different food intake and, you know, having to reduce, say, your fruits and stuff like that, which if you do have, you know, diabetic issues or prediabetes, it's something you do have to be a little careful of too with fruit, as good as fruit can be. It's still, you know, natural fruit sugar that can cause those blood sugar spikes and whatnot. So, um, you know, so... Okay, just to break it down, you're not eating grains, wheat, corn, rice, cereal, 
sugar, obviously no honey, agave, maple syrup, fruit, specifically the, the, the starchier sugary fruit, like bananas, oranges, apples, you're avoiding potatoes, yam, stuff like that. You are eating meats, you know, and ideally the cleanest things you can find, fish, beef, lamb, poultry, eggs, your leafy greens, of course, you know, spinach, kale are going to be some of your best choices. You're going to eat what they call above ground vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, super good in fiber, very low carbohydrate, so nutrient dense, amazing stuff. You're going to be having, if you do have some dairy, you want it to be, again, natural. If you can find places that do natural, like butters or real cheese, you're going to be doing nuts and seeds, specifically things like macadamias. Um, Macadamias are amazing nuts. The problem is (laughs) nuts are so expensive now. I don't know where you live, but like where I am in Canada, I mean, I'm surprised this stuff's not traded on the black market because it's probably like almonds or walnuts or macadamias, they're like, they're more expensive than like cocaine. And I'm surprised people don't trade them like that. And you go up to drug dealers with a pound of, um, you know, salted, lightly roasted almonds and whatever. And like macadamias are so expensive, but they're an amazing nut. If you look at it, it's weird that this, this nut that exists in nature is so full of healthy fats. And at the same time is almost like a multivitamin with the amount of minerals and stuff it has in it. It's, I guess I'm very fascinated by macadamia. It might not be everyone, but yeah. So you got those and sunflower seeds. Then you with fruit wise, your better choices. And I recommend this all the time too, are your berries, raspberries, blackberries. They're very low blueberries, very low glycemic, really not high in that natural fruit sugar, but very high in fiber. It's, It's why they're not overly sweet. There's more of like a bitterness, almost a sourness. And that's a good sign. That's what you want your fruit to be like. That's a little more in tune with what real fruit looks like. You've got, there is, there is room for sweeteners, which, you know, I'm not a fan of per se, but cleaner things like stevias and and whatever. And then other fats, you know, you got your coconut oil, which is one of the staples of the ketogenic diet, Um, you know, olive oil, stuff like that. So like I said, you have to be careful of, you know, not overeating on the carbohydrates because it's easy to take in a lot. And I mentioned, you know, I'd say for the average person, if they keep it under 35 grams a day, they're probably in the right range, ideally even below 20. The idea is just to not let those insulin spikes happen. So, but there is room. I mean, some people just picture that you're eating pounds of bacon and, and nuts and seeds and whatever on the diet. But like, obviously with any diet, like there still has to be a huge focus on vegetables, specifically dark green and leafy ones. And you know, every time you eat, you should have some form of, you know, the protein and the vegetables. And with, you know, you can always throw in broccoli and spinach and whatnot. And it's easy because that's what's amazing about dark green leafy vegetables is how nutritious they are. But they're like, they're almost zero calorie. There are obviously some calories, but they just don't have that impact on your body. You know, with and, and again, because there's more of that fiber content, you almost lower what the actual carb content is. And they call it like net carbs because it's not going to, because of that fiber, it's not going to have that same impact on your body. So, you know, like when you have a half cup of, of raw spinach, like the actual carbohydrates you take in from it is like 0.1 of a gram. Like there's nothing in it because there's so much fiber. Um, it just, it drops the, the overall calorie Here's this example. If you have, okay, a cup of, let's say broccoli here. In one cup, you have six grams of carbohydrates by measure, but you there's two grams of fiber in one cup. So that fiber, even though it's considered like a starch, a carbohydrate, doesn't have that impact on your body like a normal carbohydrate, like sort of sugar would be. So you can take that two grams of fiber away from the six grams And that ends up with net carbs of four grams, the actual carbohydrates that um, have that impact and effect on the body and that are processed in that way different than the fiber. So, I mean, four grams in a cup of broccoli is not a lot. So you can see how it is easy to get a lot of these still in um, to be healthy and get all the benefits from it. So it does take a lot of planning and awareness of your food and what's in it, the content, the macronutrients, everything like that. So 
getting into ketosis, this is the actual process, just sharing the information here. Again, like it does seem complicating, complicated, confusing. There's a lot of information. So here's what it looks like, just to pass it all on. You're restricting your carbohydrates. You're focusing only on the net carbs. You want to keep under 20 grams of net carbs per day, per day and below, you know, around that 35 gram of total carbs. Um, then you restrict your protein intake. And, you know, this is why it's not a high protein diet, like say like the Atkins diet or whatever. Um, so your, your protein, you don't want too much of it because that's going to help you get you more into the ketosis state. So, and for weight loss, you want to eat between 0.6 to 0.8 protein uh, grams of protein per pound of lean body mass. Um, you're not worrying about fat as much because that's the cornerstone of it, but you're getting it from those healthy sources. You, your water intake needs to be high. You want to be drinking around a gallon of water a day. Make sure you're hydrating, staying, you know, consistent with the amount you drink. It's going to, you know, not just for like hydration, but it's so many bodily functions are dependent on water, like digestion, absorption, circulation, transport of nutrients, body temperature regulation. Uh, obviously, you know, most people are very aware of that. You are got to be more careful with your snacking, even if it's healthy stuff, because it's still going to cause that insulin spike when you eat and you want to reduce that as much as possible. And that can you know, unnecessary snacking may lead to, you know, potential stalls or a slow in weight loss. And there's, you know, still the benefit of needing to exercise and that will help boost those effects uh, seemingly of, of the ketogenic response by getting at least 20, 30 minutes exercise each day, even if it's just walking. I mean, if you can throw some high intensity stuff in there like that, um, it helps. There's consideration about maybe supplementation might help like a multivitamin just to make sure you're covered even as clean as you're eating you might going to be deficient in some potential minerals and stuff like that so there's a lot of you know tricks and shortcuts and gimmicks and bulletproof coffees and stuff like that to get into optimal ketosis but it can be done just through your nutrition alone, just through your food. So you don't need magic pills to do it. I mean, our bodies have adapted this way for tens of thousands of years. It, it's just, it's like a default switch in your body. It knows what to do. You don't need special things to do it. So the idea with ketosis to know you're actually in that state, it, it's usually got to be measured through urine or blood strips. Um, so, depending on who you talk to, people are more advocates of this, say they're not really accurate to, you know, indicate where you are and the blood strips are expensive and the urine's not necessarily a good indicator. Here's what their physical symptoms that sort of reveal if you're in ketosis. So the first one is increased urination. So the idea that it's keto is a natural diuretic, so you'd be going to the bathroom more. Um, you're obviously maybe drinking more water that gallon a day compared to if you didn't have as much. Um, so, you know, there's the increased bathroom trips. There's there's dry mouth, apparently, so that, you know, the increased urination leads to dry mouth and increased thirst. So, you, obviously, you want to make sure you're drinking plenty of water. And that's why, and, and you know, I'm trying to point out the issues as well as we go here. Um, that there is the p possibility of losing electrolytes like your potassium, sodium, magnesium, stuff like that. So some people have to make sure they're they're getting those in each day, whether it's through supplementation or whatever. There's the idea that you can get a little bit of bad breath um, from it. The One of the ketone bodies, I think it's called acetone, and it excretes in your breath. Interesting side note, a lot of when you do lose weight, a lot of it is actually through your breath. I forget who was talking about this the other day. This kind of idea that you like burn off fat through sweat and, you know, you do a little bit and you lose some through urination and bodily excretions and whatever, but a big amount of it is actually through your breath and, and carbon dioxide and fat is made up of a lot of carbon chains and, and whatever. So th th this is just sort of a side thing that the breath might not smell too, too, um, too, 
uh, daisy-like, I guess. So, and then there is one of the phys- other physical symptoms of reduced hunger and increased energy. And the people who start, it, it, you don't immediately go, and I just snapped, I don't know if you heard that, you don't immediately go into ketosis. It can take a little bit. There's a transition f- period, and some people call it the keto flu, where you get sort of flu-like symptoms because your body's doing this transition. And you know, for some people, they say that's enough reason to stay away from it. Um, but when the people go into it, I'll just say straight up, I it's the one nutrition approach I've not done. I've done everything from paleo, intermittent fasting, carb cycling, a Mediterranean diet, everything. Keto is still the one thing I haven't done. And I don't know if it's just the planning structure approach where I, I've spent so much of my life, you know, measuring food and calories and balancing things. And it just does not appeal to me now having to be that much on top of it. And I'm, I like more of an intuitive eating approach and more even like the intermittent fasting approach where there's a little less guesswork to it. So I don't know if it's my own laziness or whatever, but that's, you know, people will experience that transition phase, but the people who do, and I have a ton of friends who've done this, that get into proper ketosis, talk about like, they feel like they've had like an injection of like B12 or adrenaline in their body, how energetic they feel and how their hunger levels are more balanced and how more clear they think and their energized mental state and everything like that. So interesting just seeing that, you know, from friends and whatnot. So let's look again, like as I'm trying to just share everything here, let's look at some of the issues and dangers. And if you have studied biology or chemistry or physiology, anything like that, you've probably heard of ketoacidosis and the ketone production in your body, yes, can get too high. And under normal circum- normal circumstances, you know, it might not, but it can be one of the issues where you, you know, just have to be aware of stuff like that. And again, always checking this sort of thing out with your physician, because this is, to me, one of the extreme ends of the, the dieting spectrum. Whereas like if, if you're adopting paleo, that's probably it's probably more of a natural way that you should be eating in general and you're not missing out on anything because you're reducing dairy and wheat and um, starchy carbs and stuff like that you know there's no such thing as you know essential carbohydrates or or essential starches but some of the the side effects as well so like there's that ketoacidosis which can be a deadly condition but with um, common sort of regular side effects some people look at cramps specifically leg cramps. And that happens to a lot of people who are starting out on a ketogenic diet. It's can happen in the morning or the night. Um, you know, not a huge issue, but it's probably a sign that there's a lack of the minerals, like the electrolytes in your body, like specifically magnesium and any, any cramping issues. I always think of that. It's either low hydration or low, you know, magnesium, potassium, sodium. So, you know, you got to make sure you get in clean amounts of salt, ideally like a Himalayan sea salt or a natural sea salt. Um, even the supplementation can help. There's constipation issues because, um, that's kind of connected with dehydration. So again, that's why you, people need to be having that gallon of water a day and making sure you're getting in those vegetables with the fiber, which ideally you should be doing good quality fiber from, you know, non-starchy vegetables. So like, like you're saying like the broccoli, the kale, all that sort of stuff. There's some issues with people have heart palpitations when transitioning to keto. Some people find their heart beats faster, harder. It's apparently a standard thing, but again, to be aware of needing to also be um, aware of your, your, the fluid and the salt intake and stuff like that. There's the people transitioning, we talked about how well some people do uh, with physical performance, but there can be a reduced physical performance when you're starting it out because your body has shifted from, you know, having to now get away from like carbohydrate energy into using your body fat and your strength and endurance can take a hit. Again, like I don't know this from experience, but the people transitioning into it, um, report that their strength is down, whatever, but it does return to normal, interestingly. So 
I think I'll cut it off here. I think that's covered everything as far as what ketogenic diet looks like, what ketosis is, what benefits people are finding from it, what problems people face with it. So again, take this for information purposes. This is not me promoting anything. Um, and again, anytime you would be looking into specific changes or, or, or overhauls to check with your doctor, you need to know your basic starting point. You need to know where you're at um, and just if things are to progress and to be monitored. So that's the straight up disclaimer right there. But like I said, because I am pretty sure you're seeing this everywhere. I don't know if it's at peak ketoness yet. I don't know if it's um, bottom out. I guarantee it will. I guarantee in three years, no one will be talking about it. It'll still be happening or whatever. And again, I like the, the problem with these healthy eating movements or, or eating movements in general is they, because they're new, even though they're not really new, they've been done for obviously millennia or even for, you know, decades and decades, but have more prominence now, like the Atkins diet. Everyone knows about that. I mean, that goes back to the seventies, but you know, got more prominence in the nineties, um, which I don't think is an ideal approach compared to something like the Mediterranean diet. Um, the problem is every, everyone's always looking for something new. They don't want to stay with like tried and true methods. People want what they think is sort of cutting edge change and they want like the flavor of the month and the whole deal. And I think say in the case of paleo, like two years ago, three years ago, even a little more, four years ago, I don't, depending on what you follow or what sort of circles you're involved with, you could not stay away from paleo from, like websites and books and magazines and reports and news things and every version of paleo diets or paleo for kids or paleo for dogs. That's a real thing. I've seen that paleo versions of paleo restaurants. It's just because it's, there's always hype. People want to get on board with something. And now that's sort of fallen by the wayside and people aren't as on board with it. So I'm not sure if, if keto is at its even at its peak yet it might be or it might not be and you'll see it's either reach that and it'll maybe bottom off and plateau or it's even going to spike more in the next year or two but at the moment based on you know what i see as far as i mean this is what i spend all my time doing nutrition and in the gyms and and whatever and this is what i see more often than not as a dietary approach is, is keto all the time. And people who don't even know what the hell they're talking about, they're just like, Oh, I want to go keto. Like they with no research and whatever. And that's infuriating. So again, this is just a sort of a share and approach a big subject or something that I think is relevant, or if you wanted to know more about it. And again, and I'll probably I say this like every podcast don't, you know, use this show as like a jumping off point and keep doing your own research and, and seeing what makes sense uh, for you or if it's something you try or, or, or whatever. So again, not recommending anything, just trying to share the information. So thanks for listening. If you had more questions or if you tried this yourself and want to share, like email me at info at regainwellness.com and just share your experiences, like what you liked, what you hated, struggles, benefits, all that sort of thing. So I, I read every email, so I'd be happy to check it out. Okay. How's that for 48 minutes of keto? <laughs> if you made it this long, I appreciate it. I know there's a lot of uh, other shows out there. So the fact that you stuck through this one, that means a lot. So thanks for listening. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast. If you really like it, uh, leave a, la- a rating and review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. That makes sure more people get to see it. Everybody's happy. We all win. And uh, yeah, let's call it a day. Thanks for listening. See you later.